Fun Show, where we discuss all things fire service related. Firefighting Today is a production of PeteLamb.com. And now your host, Chief Peter Lamb. Welcome and welcome to this week's roundtable. We got a pretty good panel tonight. We're going to talk about what is professional. And if anybody's watched this show before or listened to my podcast or anything, you know we're probably going down a different path than we think. So I am the uh, I am the author of PeteLamb.com. I'm the host of the Firefighter Training Podcast. And let's introduce the panel tonight and we'll see where we're going. Let's start with you, Adam. Uh, say hello. Good, e <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Adam Ganley from Kellogg, Iowa, and I am with the Kellogg Volunteer Fire Department. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. Uh, we have with us Ethan. Ethan is in witness protection, so he's not showing his face tonight. So, Ethan, uh, quick intro. Hi. Hi. There we go. Okay. Hi, Pete. Ethan Dan, Cycle Rain, Ohio, uh, student of the trade, founder of Pass It On Fire Training. And you do have video now. Great. Good. Good to have you. Joe, say hello. Hi, Pete. Joe Starnes. Um, kill the Flash Over and also honored to be a member at uh, Oak Grove Volunteer Fire Department in Kings Mountain, North Carolina. Thank you for having me. I, I, always a pleasure to have you, Joe. I love your background. No, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> John, say hello. Hi. Retired Time Chief John Cagno and founder of Lead It. All right, thank you, John. And Shane, say hello. Sorry about that. Turning on my uh, mic again. Uh, Shane White, Paris Island Fire Rescue, and a uh, lead firefighter captain with the uh, United States Marine Corps. Thank you, Shane. Always a pleasure. And last but certainly never least, Warren, say hello. Good evening, Warren Whitley, retired. Assistant Chief from Prince William County, Virginia, broadcasting live from Southport, North Carolina. Yeah, I notice you're uh, you're still in shirt sleeves out there. What's the temperature, Warren? Oh, it's a, seventy-five right now. Nice, nice. I'm not mad. I'm jealous. Um, <laughs> so tonight we're going to start a discussion about what makes a professional fire department what makes a professional fire department and you know there's a lot of opinions here a lot of people say a lot of different things a lot of people tend to try to define just define the word professional so let's get the obvious right out of the way right up front if you look at a dictionary definition Basically, it says a person, we're talking about a description of a person engaged in a specified activity as one's main paid occupation rather than a pastime. So we could end the discussion pretty quickly tonight by saying only career firefighters are professionals. But I don't think that's really where I'm headed with this. And obviously, if you know me, I don't think that's really where I'm headed at all. So, but we do have to put that out there. there. There is the purest argument that would say, if you're not getting paid, then you're not professional. So, okay, that's, that's fine. Let's, let's take that for that. But as we begin to break it down, what are the characteristics of professional? And I'm going to look to the panel. Let's, you know, don't, don't give me a whole litany, but let's pass it around uh, and do, when you're talking about people, what do you think is a professional person, or how do you view the word professional? What characteristics does that person have that uh, makes you say that they are professional? Anybody? I'd say commitment. Passion. Say commitment. 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 Okay. So we go a little further with that, John. What does that mean, commitment? So I'm a volunteer firefighter. I can be professional. You can be professional in any occupation as long as you're committed and, and you have a passion for that particular occupation. I don't think it necessarily has to mean whether you're being paid or not. It's so just we, okay, so we heard a couple of words there. We heard the word commitment and we heard the word passion. What else? What else? I know Warren's got one. He's sitting on here. He's, he's, we, we talked about it in our, in our podcast a little bit. What differentiates a trade, Warren, from a professional? What do you, what do you think? We talked about that briefly. 
We did, but <clears throat> I think we have to differentiate between a profession and being professional. All right, and so we talked about profession, but now we're talking professional. So what have you got on that side of the coin? Well, I think being professional is uh, certainly commitment, but a lot of it's attitude. You know, it doesn't matter if you're getting a paycheck or not or if you're um, – what your compensation is if you're being altruistic and just giving back to the community. But part of being in a profession or being professional is being expert. So you need to be an expert in whatever field it is you're 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 working in to be a professional. That's just one of the criteria. But that, I think, can apply across the board in the fire service as far as personnel. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good one. Joe, what do you weigh in on that, Joe Steins? What are you thinking? He's muted, Pete. No, no, I just have a failure to click. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, you know, the, the, the complicated answer has a lot of characteristics in it. The, the simple answer is that, uh, that uh, you professional implies the customer's point of view of what they're going to receive when you deliver the product or service. Uh, they expect a professional, which means a lot of things. And uh, just to pick a few that are non-skilled, you go trustworthy, competent, respectful, integrity, considerate, empathetic. Well, we could name dozens. All right. So let's go back to one of your points where you started this is, is professional, like beauty in some cases, is professional in the eye of the beholder? Is professional the person who is receiving it, or can I actually perceive myself as being professional? And maybe, in fact, I'm falling short from the citizen point of view. I don't know. What are you, what are you thinking? Ethan, why don't you weigh in on that? No, I think definitely. And, and you know, it, it comes back to how you deliver yourself, you know, both. Uh, in the firehouse and, and out on calls, it, it comes back to how you make of yourself. All right, what you make of yourself. Um, there was a little discussion. Warren used the word expert. What? How do you get to be an expert? If I don't do this full time, and it really is not my career, how do I push myself? I mean, I have some thoughts on that. How do you become an expert in your field? And in this case, we're talking about firefighting because that's what we do here. So Warren, what are your thoughts on how I can, how can I strive to be an expert? I'm, I'm not going to say, excuse me, I'm not going to say I am an expert, but how do I strive to be an expert? What are some of the things I can be doing? Well, one of the things you can do is read and read the journals uh, unfortunately for our, our profession, if you want to put it that way, is we don't have a lot of peer-reviewed journals. So a lot of what you read, you really kind of need to digest with a grain of salt and compare, do comparative literature. You know, are, is what one guy is saying being substantiated by other authors and other journals? Um, you see a lot on social media where somebody says something and everybody jumps on that bandwagon and it may or may not have any real merit. Um, so one of it's the reading, one of it's training. The only way you can put what you read into practice, which in the sociology world we call praxis, is to go out and actually do it. Put your hands on it, try it, repetition, uh, see what happens. So that's, that's part of it. I like it. I like it. Any other thoughts on things you can do? And I think Warren brings up, this is kind of a teachable moment. we got a bunch of viewers out there tonight. Unfortunately, we, it's, it's difficult to get the feedback that we need to get tonight. But for the viewers that are out there, Warren's point is, you're reading stuff in trade journals today. There is no, I could just write an article. I can write an article and say I'm an expert, and if the editor likes it and it gets published, it becomes gospel. And that the, you need to somewhat filter a little bit. Peer review would be the answer, but you need to filter. Did the author come from the same size department in the same circumstances as you did? Are you working under the same conditions? So as you begin to absorb information, you can absorb 
bad information as well as good information. What, what do, does a professional have to have procedures? Does a professional have to have the best equipment? Can I have lesser equipment and still be a professional? I broke this into people, procedures, and equipment because I believe that's like the root of all evil for a lot of things. You can solve a lot of problems when you begin to talk about these things. We talked about some of the characteristics of the people. We talked about perceptions. But what, what about professional procedures? What does the term best practices mean? If I'm following best practices, does that make me more professional? Shane, you want to weigh in? Because you've got more procedures than any of us, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know, we're working through our second round on the accreditation process. Um, and so say what you will about accreditation, uh, those kinds of things. Um, the one thing that the accreditation congress, uh, conference group is trying to get around to getting the information out about is that um, accreditation is not an end-all be-all. What they're actually, their actual goal is to get departments improving themselves. It's, a, it's an improvement process. And to me, procedures, having procedures is one thing. It's the constant review of and changing of as necessary an update of that helps make a department more professional. Um, there's, you know, you can, can be, any one of these things tonight can be debated. Uh, we had little comments going on in the group chat. Uh, you can go down the rabbit hole on any, almost any definition you want to use, but to me, the professional organizations are the ones that are constantly looking at what it is they're doing to find out if what they're doing is the best way to go about serving their base, their tax base, and improving when they can and where they can in order to deliver the best possible service to those people that they work for. All right, so professional is tied to the delivery of service in some ways. So let's, Shane asked a couple of questions, and I have a, I have a guy, I'll see if I can strike a nerve here in a minute. So he said accreditation is a method, a, a way to, to guide you to becoming professional. What about, uh, what about ISO? Uh, what about if you are an ISO, um, a, a class one fire department? What, where does that put you? Is that professional only to you and your peers? Is that professional to the insurance industry? Or does that really mean service delivery, as Shane said, to the customer? Uh, anybody anybody want to go down that path? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that, Chief. I, I think it all goes back to approach. Um, for example, you could be a rated class one fire department. What's your approach and philosophy to that? Is it, you know, continually following down that path to continue to improve, like Shane saying, with accreditation? What are you doing for your stakeholders in the community? Are you delivering the services that's expected of you? Um, so, you know, it's, it, it goes along with, with the whole, it's like a recipe. Uh, you get a lot of ingredients that go into that. Um, certainly, you know, the insurance uh, stakeholders weigh into that, but I think it's more about um, whether you're, you're following through on it and you're continuing to maintain that status, you know, and improve upon it, which goes along with Jane saying about accreditation. Those are great points. I mean, because where I live, I'm less, a little more than an hour, I guess, from, uh, and, and I'm not trying to throw disparagements at anybody, uh, but I'm right down the road from one of the ISO 1 organizations that unfortunately um, suffered a huge tragedy not that long ago. And we all know the reasons for that. And ISO accreditation, whichever system you're using, the key to that is that you can't stop improving. Just because you have the one or just because you become accredited doesn't mean that that's the end. And that, and I don't think anybody's disagreeing with what I said, but I think that that needs to be said because I to bring back the organization that I live near, uh, I believe personally that that's what they did. They got the one and they thought, well, we've been We've been proven that it's been proven that what we are doing is right, and so we never need to change. And unfortunately, that 
got people killed. Right, right. Yeah, no, I think everybody's familiar with that. I guess, he, so we, we kind of waded into this. I had these slides prepared. Um, so what we're talking about is how is performance, uh, professionalism measured or determined, and does it matter? Does it matter? Um, okay. and, and I'm being sarcastic when I say that. But how do we measure it? We've heard a bunch of definitions tonight. We're all across the board. We're kind of tiptoeing a little bit. Can we put, can we put, uh, can we quantify this in some cases? Can we, how is professionalism measured? How do you know what's going on? I'm leading us into another round table about a whole nother word about yeah, measurement. Yeah, performance objectives, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anybody, uh, Ethan, you're a student in the trade. You read a lot of stuff. You see a lot of stuff. How how do you make decisions what's professional? Well, I think going back to what we said before, it's in the eye of the beholder. Uh, in our case here, I think it's based on what the citizen perceives of the fire department, uh, whether that's positive or negative. All right, so let me ask you this. Let me just toss this out there. Since I'm tossing grenades, let me throw one out there. Is, is effective financial support a sign of professionalism? If the public is not questioning you in terms of tax base, in terms of funding, if you're not being cut, does that necessarily correlate to the fact that you could be perceived as being professional. I don't know. I'm 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 tossing it out it, there. It, it's a perception, but certainly it would help you become more professional. Uh, you know, like in order to be professional, along with the approach issue, is you, you need the proper equipment, training, and techniques, and finances weighs heavily into that. So, yeah, I, I think it could be in some respect. Does it? Is, is it the answer? No, but. You know, obviously, if you're getting the funding, that allows you to become more professional in this, you know, in the examples of getting the equipment that you need to do the job properly. Okay, fair enough. So, the, the, I'm not going to let this one escape the chat room. So, uh, Mr. Whitley, would you, uh, how would the public even know what a professional fire department is? Well, that was my comment. You know, what... What do they have to base it on, especially if it's somebody who, like say in the little city I'm in now, has had almost no exposure to any other fire department, you know, unless they've gone to Wilmington or Raleigh or someplace. This is what they have. You know, is it good? Is it bad? They, this is the only experience they have. So stepping away from this department, let's, let's go to a, a hypothetical one where let's say the, the, the crews have no regard for fire behavior, dynamics, things like that, and they routinely break all the windows out of a house, house burns down. That's just the routine. Does the public really know that there's a different way of doing business that's more professional based on expert knowledge, or, you know, what do they base that perception on? We yeah, know what I, the difference is. Well, I, I'm going to challenge you, Warren. Do, does this panel, can we put our finger on it? I haven't heard it yet, so do we even know what we call a professional? We got a comment from the chat. Uh, we did get a, a Twitter comment. Uh, if you do want to reach us on uh, Twitter, if you use uh, Pete Lamb, you know, if you tweet something with Pete Lamb, we'll probably pick it up. So somebody said something about uniform. People see people in uniform, therefore they expect professionalism that comes with the uniform. So does that matter to any degree, or is that, I mean, I think it's a smaller piece of the puzzle, but where does that fit? Where does the uniform thing fit, or doesn't it? Anybody? I think that fits into an expectation. That's, okay. that's a percept, failed perception error, I think. Is, you know, Say that again, point. a failed perception error. Did you just make that up? I'm going to go with that, but what? What are you? Yeah, where are you going? Just because with that? you're you're pulling up in a uniform, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're a professional. That's a perception that the public or the person that you're responding to may think, but that doesn't necessarily make you a professional because you're wearing a uniform. 
I mean, it could be a fish day on the job. Does that make you a professional because you're in the uniform? Uh, in, no. In, mo in most cases, it only provides a means for identification. identification so exactly. That, that's the way I would put it, Joe. So, exactly. Well, so, but I think if you carry you know, it further, <clears throat> what do you expect when you see a doctor in a lab coat? That's professional. That's the symbol of his office, right? The uniform is a symbol of us. Same with a cop. People expect certain behaviors when you put that symbol on. Right. That's the fatal perception ever that I'm talking about. Well, I agree, but I think... You, you can have a doctor in a lab coat. He's not a great doctor. I completely understand your point, but the public's perception is going to be that there's a professional compared to somebody who shows up on a scene in sneakers and blue jeans. He may be, they may be experts and perform professionally. And just looking at them, the first uh, inclination would be, oh, look what showed up. Well, I'm, I'm hearing a couple things out of that exchange. So there's identification, there's perception, but we're now beginning to talk about where I wanted to go with this to some degree, and that is uh, competence. Right? I mean, a professional, Warren started this conversation with, you should be trying to be an expert. Now, whether you get to expert or not, and, and, and we could go down that path, what is an expert? You know, I've done it 16, what is it, 10,000 hours or something or whatever. You know, there's, there's all kinds of measures of what makes you an expert, the number of times you've done something, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I, think, I think that that's an issue. But we really are talking about a professional is trained, educated, and competent. You got a problem, Pete. We have continuous Pete loop. We're in a loop. All right, is that any better? Yeah, we're yeah, all set, Pete. You're back. All right. all right, so what? where did we lose that? I started with competence education. Competency, yeah. You're right there. All right, so competence, education, and so forth is is what we're looking for, uh, and and how how do we aim at that? Um, how do we aim at that expert level? So gaining competence and education is is certainly something that is going to make us more professional. Uh, that's just Pete's opinion. I don't know what. Uh, it's not. It's not a measure of it, though, Chief, because a customer would determine that. Yeah, all right, it so. Well, it wouldn't matter what I trained in. It would matter how my customer felt I did. All right. Let's go back to the doctor. If the, if the doctor was a first-year resident and you, you didn't have any confidence, if, if, the, if you said and you go to a doctor and you're going to have surgery and the guy says, I've done 2,000 of these surgeries and I've been doing it for 24 years, would that make you feel better? If he had Parkinson's, no. <laughs> if he had Parkinson's, no. Okay, I guess that's a fair. I guess that's a fair statement. I have How about, a, you, uh, you know, you you can have a professional, but at the same time, are you within a professional organization? You, you, you know what I mean? We got two issues here. You know, and how do we? Um, determine that. I mean, you talk about competency, you can have a department that mandates competencies, but now you got the individual that has to maintain them competencies, you know, leading up to the expert level. I think you had more faith in the AMA that that, was a, that would happen because of what you said, Chief, not because of, he had 20 years experience. I think the, the history of the American Medical Association as it relates to doctors in America gives you that confidence. 
what's missing for us in a lot of cases in the fire service is who, who, who's the customer comparing them like we said a while ago? Who are they comparing it to? What standard? What did they benchmark to? If we have a standard that we got a, we got a certification from an organization, that certification means that we've complied with a standard. And if, if what is that standard? Do we know what it is? Are we managing to it daily? If we if we got the stamp and didn't manage to it daily, it's like the problem we talked about before. But I think I think the trade itself creates the 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 perception for the customer that it's it's like a brand. It creates the perception that it is quality, and I can trust it. Uh, the American Fire Service has and still does the highest level of trust of any organization in in the country. I mean, we're the only ones that can violate the threshold of the home and, and break into it. So we have the highest level of trust. I, I tell our volunteers all the time, that's what they can't destroy. But how did they get that trust? Like you said, they got it through a lot of years of it not being bad. They got it through the perception that the, that the organizations per, portray out there every day. If they have a trade organization that says they're quality and they do a good job, there's not a lot of lawsuits in the in the in the news, then your faith and your confidence is up. Well, I I'm gonna challenge you a little bit, Joe. I mean you're saying the doctor, I trust the doctor because of the AMA. Well, the firefighters in my town are NFPA certified, so that must be the NFPA is going to be as good as the AMA, right? Yeah, but your your Mrs. Smith doesn't know that. Well, she, maybe she, she knows. Does. I don't know. She knows that the, there's a medical association. She doesn't know what the National Fire Protection Association is and how they impact you. I mean, she trusts you because you're a fire department. Most people are trusted because they're part of the community. They're not trusted because they they're wearing a uniform. They're trusted because they're wearing a uniform and they're a part of the community. I, I well, think it's a matter of trust. You can't discount the education aspect of it either. Most people understand that doctors have gone to college for at least six years or longer, um, and, but not taking away from the trust aspect of it, and that's where you get into the AMA versus the NFPA. I, you know, people look at the education aspect of it. Most people, I don't think, realize how many firefighters have achieved degrees and advanced degrees because it's really not an expectation of the fire service yet. It's slowly getting there, but it's not a requirement, and most people, I think, innately know that, and the fire departments aren't doing any favors to themselves or the public by not working towards that goal a little more aggressively, and we're not selling ourselves... I've been saying this for years now. We're losing the PR battle. We're not selling ourselves educationally I like to as agree well. I with Shane, Shane now, what you're saying there about, uh, you know, we're not promoting ourselves. You know, how many fire departments I've actually published what the qualifications of their firefighters are? Um, you know, certainly you can promote that uh, to your community by uh, a, a number of different ways uh, because there's a lot of fire departments that – Firefighters have a number of degrees, or they, you know, they listing continuing education requirements, NFPA uh, mandates and requirements. There, I mean, we don't do anything to really promote our educational level. Um, you might have a patch on your shoulder that says that you're an EMT, uh, which mo most people can recognize. But other than that, you know, you don't have you know any list of credentials on your uniform, so. Um, you know, we're not doing, I agree 100% what you're saying, Shane. We're not promoting ourselves in that area. You know, which tends to make the public rely on your professional capability. Right. And, and you know, you compare one department to another. Um, and I'm not trying to necessarily do that because there's a lot of great volunteer departments out there who have more, as much or more professional than a lot of paid departments that are out there. I've seen both ends of the spectrum. Absolutely. Um, and it's, I had a, a thought that I was going with there, but it's, some departments have a much higher level of expectation, and they require degrees. Uh, they're getting, I'm hearing some departments are starting to talk about having an associate's degree and you would get a job with them, but does the public know that? Does the public know that this professional organization, professional organization, 
requires degrees versus the one next door who doesn't. Uh, and once again, we have to be selling ourselves. Now, if you're that organization who's not requiring degrees, obviously you don't want that to be as public knowledge because maybe that doesn't make you look as good in the public eye. But there's a lot of places that are happy to go on the call, come back to the station, close the bay doors, and when the public says, hey, can we ask for a tour? Nope, don't bother me. Stay away from me. Leave, just leave me alone until you call 911, and then I'll do my job, and you just have to accept that I'm doing what I'm supposed to do when I'm supposed to do it. Well, I think that, yeah, that, I mean, that was a good exchange. I like some of the, the exchange. I think that we are, um, in most communities, right, you're, you, you don't have many volunteer police forces, right? You have a lot of volunteer fire departments. You don't have a ton of volunteer police forces. If you match the firefighters' level of uh, expertise, whether it's their entry-level training to a police officer's entry-level training, the standard is much different. And some fire departments may hurt themselves if they compared themselves to their brothers and sisters in blue. They could hurt themselves, quite frankly, because people's expectation is, why aren't you more like that? So there is this whole uh, comparison that you could get yourself in trouble. I think, Shane, you mentioned it earlier. I think one of the things that saves a lot of fire departments but is the fact that nobody can compare them. When Chief Bernasini said customer, he was assuming there were six restaurants and I could pick the one I wanted to go to. That's not what happens in my world, right? There's one fire department, and that's who you're getting if you're within that jurisdictional boundary. So I think that when we get into this comparison mode, we really get into some trouble about what we're going to do. Um, I, what effect does... Let's just go to the uniform thing for a minute. What effect does the casual T-shirt have on our professional image? Everybody's aware of a Class B uniform with a work shirt and, and uniform pants. What, what effect does a casual T-shirt with a Maltese on it, maybe it's a uniform T-shirt, maybe it is part of your uniform, what does that say about our professional image, or doesn't it matter? And maybe it doesn't. Maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I'm asking. Um, any, anybody got some, uh, some thoughts on that? Adam, what do you think? You're you're a volunteer in a rural community. Do do folks not you certainly, but do folks wear their t-shirts out in the bar, or do folks wear their t-shirts having a beer, or what? What does uh, that do? Yeah, they, they actually we do have some that actually wear them to the bar, and, and me being me, I I totally disagree with it. Right, it's just my opinion, but uh, I totally disagree with um, our guys wearing their fire shirts in the bar drinking. Right, right. I think, so So when you go out and you're wearing that Maltese and you're, I, you know, if you're, I don't know, if you're at a fire conference and there's 10 million firemen in your network and I think that's a different situation than being in your hometown and, and uh, at the local pub, does that affect our professional image? Uh, Adam's thinking it might. Ethan, what are you thinking? No, I think it definitely does. Uh, number one, when you're wearing it, it signifies that you are a firefighter, and they compare that uh, to the image that you're in the firehouse, in my opinion. Uh, and if you get in trouble off-duty with that image on, uh, with that shirt on, it's not, uh, you know, Joe Smith got arrested. It's firefighter Joe Smith got arrested. Right, right. Um Joe Steins, you had a comment about, you know, if it's if it's too hot out. What what was your comment? No, I was just saying a, a t shirt with and wearing everybody wearing a job t shirt that's uniformly marked in an environment that's hundred and six degrees is probably more acceptable than a long sleeve job shirt with three firefighters who come in with a bad attitude and on a medical call. So right. I, I don't think the shirt defines it. I think the uniformity of your approach defines it. So if you're nice and if you do things and I think and you're recognizable and that's how you're recognizable, I think that makes it okay. I think like you're saying, the obvious thing of uh, a volunteer having a tag on the front of this vehicle 
and that and then uh, of a volunteer fire department and then going out and cutting donuts in the schoolyard is just as inappropriate as as the other is so branding and taking care of the uh, of the trust that we've been given I think we inherited our trust chief you talk about the volunteer and the career I think the volunteer fire service has inherited it, its trust I don't think it's something they can they can not lose I think we can lose it if we act stupid and we have in some cities and towns and communities but we've got to protect that trust and we've got to act like it's valuable to us that's one of the things we talked about last week that particular characteristic was valued and I think that's important that we value it. and it's obvious that we value it you know we're respectful to all the characteristics that talk about that so uh, I think that's where I'm coming from with it I think it's the uniformity and the way it's carried makes it what it is Chief Lamb? Yeah, go ahead. You know, I, I think it starts with, um, you know, the department itself. The department itself is promoting a certain mission statement and a certain, certain core values. And then you have, you know, an uncommon commitment towards the job itself. And then you promote that to the public. You can be not only perceived but actually understood to be professional within your community and I think that's the approach that you need to do um, and, and to go along with um, what she started saying is, is that you know we've been entrusted in that community because of recognition but we can lose that and, and you can lose that simply by you know somebody messing up getting in trouble you know like we see out here recently um, you know so it starts with formulating that trust all right and I think you know we could go off on the whole trust thing where you know trust is earned and all of those things and I think that we may be behaving with a trust that we hope is not misplaced what are we going to do about it what what are we as a panel what are we as as fire service leaders such as we are what are we going to do to help departments become more professional? Uh, they, you know, is there something that each of us could do as we're training, as we're doing, as we're, we're doing other things? What, what, my question is, what are you going to do to make yourself and your department more professional? We've got a bunch of viewers listening right now. Uh, what are they going to do and, and how could we help them? Shane, you want to dive in? Yeah, actually, I think... I think what we're doing right now is a, is a step toward that. Um, by, by the more of us in the, as professionals who are stepping forward and sharing our ideas and working to make the, the system more of a profession than a trade, as Warren and I have been discussing in the chat section, that is a, that's a big part of it. And those people who are listening are a big part of that. They're improving themselves. Hopefully they're getting something from listening to us. Hopefully we're providing the quality product that they can take something away from and that is those are all great steps towards improving not only your own department but our service as a whole oh, I agree we got a comment from uh, Sean Max Firebox uh, Sean who said that you know continuous improvement continuous effort towards improvement leads toward professionalism so I think that's a great that's a great right. comment, and, and, and we've I mean, echoed that a little bit as well. Definitely, and that goes right along with another comment that was in the chat box, uh, chat room a little bit ago I, that I threw out there that I've heard in many multiple fire departments. I'm sure everybody on this panel has heard. Are you a 20-year firefighter because you have 20 years of experience, or are you a 20-year firefighter because you have one year experience 20 times? Uh, you have to ask yourself that as a professional. Right. So, 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 
Okay, got it. There you are, Pete, you're done. Sounds like Peter's still working through his. But I guess we just have to carry on without Pete. Chime in on what it was I was just saying. Warren, you want to take it next? Well, I, carry on without him. I forgot what you were thinking. They're talking about. <laughs> I'll go well, with the. I just put in. Well, talking about, you know, what we're doing to the for our per, our uh, agencies. Well, one thing, training, education, promoting that. I just put a comment in about volunteer departments. Think about how officers are selected. You know, would it be acting more professional to? pick people based on training, education, and their merit rather than voting for them. Um, so, so, so. Yeah, you're still you're still looping there, Pete. One of the things too, Warren, when we talk about that, I, I I think we need as an organization to set down and define in our organization what a professional is in our own organization. And then we need to benchmark the things like the standards organizations, and we need to benchmark someone who's doing it well and who's getting the feedback that they are professional. We need, but we need to sit down as a chief and assistant chief and officers and say, what's what's it mean to be a professional at Oak Grove Volunteer Fire Department? And if it does, what what is that? Can we talk about the T-shirts? Can we talk about the tags? Can we talk about the the uh, conversations we have in the street? Can we talk about how good we need to be as an EMT or how good we need to be as a firefighter. So EMTs have more standards out there than firefighters do. So let's talk about it. Let's define it, write it down. Let's let's keep score and then at the end let's improve it. Let's do it again and, and let the customer know and ask the customer how we're doing. These are all basic principles I think. Yeah, and keep the focus groups. If you think about uh, what you just said about EMTs, right, and um, how you know they're required to do more continuing ed than the, the average firefighters and the things, but you know at the same rate, you know you you can have bad EMTs too. And you know, I think the only way to solve this problem would be to you know not only the continuing ed section of it, but some form of performance objectives on an annual basis coupled with what you're saying about standardizing the agencies that standardize us. Yeah, well, think about what Jane said about accreditation. You know, a lot of volunteer departments, there's no way and even smaller paid departments will ever become accredited because of the criteria. But the, you can do a self-accreditation assessment based on that process. Absolutely. And figure out a road map of what you can do to improve to maybe someday become accredited um, you know and that, there's a there's a document that says here's what we're going to do to improve to meet these standards well the other thing is the the accreditation actually says there might be a standard let's go read it but, yeah exactly you know Warren I, I, I think you know you talked about it earlier maybe it was you Chief Steins um, uh, about different volunteer organizations that are extremely professional and extremely sharp um, compared to maybe some um, professional career departments. Uh, and, you know, what is the key ingredient to that equation? And I think it goes back to leadership and approach. And I think this is where it all fails. It's on the leadership end um, of the formula. I, I agree. I think I think one of the things it's like any good organization or any good business, you got to sit down and define yourself. You got to sit down and say, 
like Alan Brunison used to tell me, it's, it's important. You have you a do. mission statement. You got to say what you don't stand for as well as what you stand for. Exactly. Chief no, Lane, are you back? Up. I I believe I am back. Am I back? Yes, you are. You're back. Don't ever do that again. Yeah, well, we, we lost a ton of viewers in that, yeah. and I really don't know what the challenge was, but uh, we did lose a ton of viewers. I apologize for that. That was, uh, I've never seen that happen, so uh, I, I'm not sure what's happening here at all. But uh, so where do we end this thing? Where do we, what are the summary statements? Yeah, you know, I. Are we, are we bad again here? No, I, I, we got you back. I, I think it starts, what we, we were discussing this when we lost you, Pete. Um, you know, we were talking about, um, you know, defining um, what you stand for and what you don't stand for is what uh, Chief, Chief Stanz added, added into that. Um, and promoting that. And you have to have a, a mission statement, a vision, um, and, and a, a standard set of core values. I, I think that it, we were failing on the leadership end is where, where it starts. Yeah, but one of the things I wanted Joe to take off on, and, and we didn't go down that path, was, all right, I got a mission statement. I got core values. I got all of that stuff, and I don't follow it every day. There are a lot of departments that are paper tigers. Joe made a phrase yeah. earlier about managing to the standard. Everybody's got a mission statement, and 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 if you went to if you went to forty percent of the job, they wouldn't even know where to find it or what it is because nobody is managing to it. And I think that's one of the things that that professionalism. Uh, Joe, do you want to add to that? I, that that was your phrase there. Yeah, yeah. You you're going to say what you're going to do, do what you say, measure your performance. Ask your customer if he did okay, and we'll go back and do it again. You, right. But if it's you a, don't, if you don't count it, you you didn't. Uh, the coach from Indiana says if if you're not scoring in it, it's practice. And so we we go out and we practice a lot. We practice on our customer's property. We need to score it. We need to sit down and say, what are we doing? How well are we doing? You know. We, we'll do a little thing at Oak Grove for a while back, and we sit down, and we had about 45 people in the room. And we brainstorm on the on the whiteboard what professionalism was, and they came up with a bunch of characteristics. One of them we practiced. We had them all get up out of their chair, push their chair back under the table, and say, that's where you want to leave it when you leave. That's a pretty simple act. But before that, when they got out of their chair, wherever their chair landed, they left it. So it's behaviors, and you, we have to decide what behaviors we want, what skills we want. We have to check for those skills constantly, and we have to see how we're performing, and we have to continuously improve. All right. All right. Sounds good. Uh, Ethan, what's your, what's your comment there? Go ahead. Well, I took a class at the Ohio Fire Expo a couple of weeks back, and uh, John Dixon talked a lot about this. He goes, uh, a lot of departments have a mission statement that's a page or two long, and no one can remember it. Uh, and essentially, if you can't remember it, you can't live by it or you can't follow it. So keep it simple. Right, right. I think that's a, I think that's a valid approach. So what we've done here tonight is we've talked a little bit about professionalism as it is. We've talked about um, professionalism in people. Uh, we talked about the organization in itself. It, I want people to leave this session tonight and, and actually try to make a difference in their, in their organization. Have this discussion that we're having right here at an offices meeting. Have this discussion at a membership meeting. You're at a, a, a monthly membership meeting with the volunteers. Ask the question, are we professional? And if we are, who told you that? Who said we were professional? Was it just us that said we were professional? So I think that's what I wanted to do was stimulate a discussion, have somebody go through this exercise in their own organization. I think it might be helpful, and I think that's something that you can do. I think the discussion of professional and professionalism might be the place to begin and then follow it up with some action. I think that might make some sense. 
Uh, anybody got anything to add as we begin to uh, wrap it up here? All right, if not, what we're doing for the folks that are still with us is that next week, uh, the show will occur next week. It will not be live. It will be posted uh, on, on Monday. So the show will be posted on Monday to YouTube, but we will record it uh, next week. So we will see you next week on Firefighting Today.